And if you look at legumes versus meat, well, you know, fiber is, is or I'm sorry, legumes are higher, very high in all of the, the positive food components, while meat contains almost nothing. Um, and, and for the, you know, the pathogenic components, legumes are, are low or zero and meat is moderate to high. And if you look at studies specifically on red meat and mortality, you see consistently, you know, processed red meat has the greatest impact somewhere between what 13 and 44% increased risk. Uh, unprocessed meat is, is lower somewhere five to what 18% increased risk. Um, but, but red meat consistently, whether it's processed or not, increases risk of mortality. Whereas legumes, it's the exact opposite. We have a 2023 review and systematic meta-analysis, a uh, review and meta-analysis of 32 cohorts, over a million people that show total mortality dropped 6% for every 50 grams, or that's about a, just over a quarter cup increase in legume intake. And um, a 2004 study looked at people uh, 70 years of age at plus, uh, from a variety of cultures. And the only statistically significant food indicator of longevity was legume intake. For every 20 grams or two thirds of an ounce, that's I think, you know, less than two tablespoons, um, there was a seven to 8% reduction in mortality. And based on this study, eating a cup of beans a day would reduce mortality 60 to 68%. That's pretty impressive. To me, the acid test, again, is the blue zones. And the lifestyle practices that are common to all blue zones are they have strong families. They tend not to smoke. They're socially engaged. They do constant, moderate physical activity. They eat plant-based diets. And they all include legumes as a dietary staple. Protein-rich plant foods essentially put a lid on the drivers of chronic disease, like inflammation, lipotoxicity, dysbiosis, and oxidative stress. Plant rich whole, uh, protein rich whole plant foods promote a healthy gut microbiome. They lower LDL and uh, cholesterol and blood pressure. They stabilize blood glucose. They increase satiety, reduce caloric density, and support healthy body weights. They reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. We have clear, consistent evidence that people need to eat more plant based foods and fewer animal based foods. There are many national and international health authorities that agree. We have the World Health Organization, 12 Steps to Healthy Eating. Their first step is eat a nutritious diet based on a variety of foods originating mainly from plants rather than animals. We have a number of international leaders that were highlighted in plates, pyramids, and planet from the FAO. Germany, choose mostly plant-based foods. Brazil, eat foods mainly of plant origin. Qatar emphasized plant-based diet, including vegetables, fruits, whole, ga whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. The UK eat more plant foods, including at least five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. We have cancer organizations like the American Cancer Society that say eat a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant foods. The World Cancer Research Fund eat mostly foods of plant origin. The American Institute of Cancer Research choose mostly plant foods such as vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, and cut sugary drinks. We have the Lancet Commission that says healthy diet that that advises healthy diets from sustainable food systems will safeguard our planet and and improve health of billions of people. Their universal healthy reference diet is one that increases consumption of healthy foods, which are vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and nuts and decreases consumption of unhealthy foods, red meat, sugar, and refined grains. And Canada's food guide, which I'm very proud to say, um, is you know half the plate is fruits and vegetables, a quarter uh, grains, preferably whole grains, and a quarter protein-rich foods. But they say specifically choose protein foods that come from plants every day. Plant-based protein foods can provide more fiber and less saturated fat than other types of protein foods. And they also add, you don't need to eat large amounts of protein foods to meet your nutritional requirements. And I will conclude by talking briefly about the benefits beyond ourselves. Plant protein sources are more ecologically sustainable. 
If you look at popular diets and their carbon footprint, this is a, a 2023 study. You can see keto diets at the top, which produce 2.91 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per thousand calories. Paleo at 2.62, omnivore at 2.23, pescatarian 1.66, vegetarian 1.16, and vegan at 0.69. So on average, keto diets produce four, a 4.2 times greater carbon footprint than vegan diets. There are five main indicators of environmental impact. Greenhouse gas emissions, 26% of which come from food and agriculture. Land use, over 50% of habitual of habitable, hab, habitable land is for food and agriculture. Uh, water pollution, 78% comes from food and agriculture. Water use, 78% from food and agriculture, 90% in scarce water region, and acidifying emissions, 32% come from food and agriculture. And if we look at greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food, what I want you to notice is animal flesh products are in the red, dairy products and eggs in the yellow and plant foods in the green. And you can see the kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of food. You know, the, all, all of the top producers are animal products, beef and prawns and cheese and fish and pig meat and poultry meat and eggs. And then you have rice and, and, and you have the plant foods. The lower end of the spectrum are all plant foods with the exception of milk. Beef herd cattle produces 30 times, 31 times more greenhouse gas emissions than tofu. If we look at land use, um, milligrams per kilogram of food produced, uh, and, and again, you see at the, the top of the chart, uh, lamb, mutton, beef, cheese, and um, beef herd. Beef herd uses 105 times more land than tofu. And then if we look at water pollution in phosphate equivalents per kilogram of food produced, again, you see at the top, uh, you know, beef, fish, prawns, cheese, lamb, mutton, pig meat, poultry, and then uh, rice, eggs, nuts, uh, their pulses. And then at the bottom are, you know, things like grains and, 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 and legumes. And beef herd causes 59 times more water pollution than tofu. Uh, water use, uh, we, we see here nuts being fairly high, cheese being the highest, and then uh, a number of animal foods like fish, prawns, and beef, and then rice and peanuts. But beef herd uses 18 times more water than tofu. And acidifying emissions, uh, here we've got, you know, again, uh, animal products uh, um, being at the top of the chart. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten, I think the 11 top producers and beef herd produces 48 times more acidifying emissions than tofu. And if we look at, um, you know, meat, uh, aquaculture, eggs and dairy, they use 83% um, of the world's farmland, contribute about 56 to 80% of the world's food emissions and pollution, providing just 37% of our protein. And uh, plant-based diets provide more ethically justifiable means of uh, getting protein. We slaughter 200 million land animals every, every day for food. That's over 70 billion per year. And over 90% of these animals are raised in CAFOs or confined animal feeding operations. And to me, it makes no sense to cause pain, suffering and death and other living beings when it's not only unnecessary, but it harms both people and the planet, essentially undermining our very life support systems. By getting our protein from plants, we all win. And we have a choice as human beings when we consider the consequences of our food choices, not just for ourselves, but beyond ourselves. Getting protein from plants becomes both an ecological and an ethical imperative. And uh, these are some of my books, the latest book, Plant Powered Protein. And I thank you so much for your attention. And I went significantly longer with the presentation than I thought I would. Uh, so I will stop my share and take some questions. <laughs>